When the Lexus LFA was new, it wasn't a big seller. In fact, US Lexus dealers reported selling three brand new leftover LFAs in 2019, despite the car having ended production seven years earlier and only 500 being made. But things have changed since then, a lot. Their values have increased by six figures in less than 12 months, so it's safe to say the secret is out. Formerly misunderstood and now wildly appreciating, the LFA is finally being recognized for what it is, one hell of a ride. The problem with the LFA is that the hugely compelling value proposition that it offers isn't clear unless you study the car closely or experience it firsthand. Ideally, both. And the challenge with that is access. With so few examples made and an original MSRP of $375,000 and a street value more than twice that today, most of the people passing judgment on the LFA have to do so without experiencing it firsthand. And so those people are left with the performance figures. By the numbers, the car is fast, but so are a whole host of other cars you could have bought instead in 2010, and most of them cost a lot less. For example, for LFA money in 2010 you could have had four Nissan GTRs, or two Porsche Turbo S's, or two AMG SLS's. Even a Ferrari 599 cost less. Yet remarkably, while the LFA's value today is easily twice its original MSRP, none of these other cars is worth much more than its original new price, and some are worth half what they cost new. While the LFA was an outlier in price when it was new, the gap is even bigger today. That shows that the folks at Toyota who developed this car did something very, very right with it, and whatever that something was, it's standing the test of time beautifully. So what exactly did they do? It was really quite simple, actually. They freed some of their most passionate engineers and designers to create the ultimate driver-oriented supercar and told them that it didn't need to make money. That last part about not making money is critically important. At the time, Toyota was the world's largest car maker. Instinctively, their goal is to make money whatever they do, and at this scale, this means selling huge numbers. To sell this kind of volume, they need to create products that appeal to large numbers of consumers, cars that offer something for everyone. From the outset, the LFA wasn't going to do that. Instead, it's incredibly focused, not just technically, but the experience it provides. The genesis of this car began, famously, at a bar. The man who would become its chief engineer, Haruhiko Tanahashi, was on a work trip at Toyota's cold weather proving ground on the northernmost Japanese island of Hokkaido in early 2000. Drinking together is a notoriously central part of Japanese work culture, and it was in this context that Tanahashi's boss asked him what he would truly like to make, and like any proper petrol head, he replied, a sports car. Instead of being told to be reasonable, Tanahashi-san was given the go-ahead, and so he assembled a team to conduct some preliminary study. The car would have to be a proper flagship, something to show what Toyota Motor Company was capable of, something to transform Lexus's sensible, dull reputation by igniting the passion of the true driving enthusiast. To do this, it needed to be more than just fast. Although the V10 power plant is usually the first thing people think about when it comes to the LFA, Tanahashi-san is a chassis man, and the car would need to have a live, athletic feel not just as a general impression on the street, but with on-track performance to prove it unequivocally. The first prototype was completed in the summer of 2003, and by October of 2004 the car was developed enough to take it to the most demanding performance driving environment on Earth, the Nürburgring. The car proved to be well behaved, but performance fell short of the desired targets, in large part due to its weight, around 3,500 pounds. At the same time, management was pushing to reimagine the car with a carbon fiber tub, instead of the aluminum one as the car had been built. 
Toyota habitually insources manufacturing processes in order to vertically integrate their company, a type of thinking that isn't typical in most specialist supercars. But then most specialist supercars aren't built by companies that sell 7 million cars a year. Toyota's management saw the LFA as an opportunity to build expertise that they did not yet possess, specifically the ability to manufacture carbon fiber, which requires completely different techniques and equipment for metallic structures. Carbon fiber would also help reduce the weight of the car, which it ultimately did by some 220 pounds. Thus, in 2005, even though the car was already five years into its development, the engineers started over in order to make the central structure out of carbon fiber. While the decision to make a supercar out of carbon fiber seems like a given today, things were different in the early 2000s. This was before the Aventador and the Alfa Romeo 4C. At the time, carbon fiber chassis were used in cars like the McLaren F1, Ferrari F50, and Bugatti EB110, putting the new Lexus supercar, then known as the LF-A, in rarefied company. Certainly it gives the car a racy vibe, but the thing that gives the car the most racing credibility was, of course, racing. Taking the notion that developing the LFA on the Nürburgring would yield an exceptionally high performance car to the next level, Tanahashi's team decided to take their new car racing years before the production car was ready for customers. In fact, this was the point. Rather than convert a road car to race, they went the other way. They raced the car, which was still under development, as a prototype, and then used the lessons to refine the production car. 2008's race proved to be informative, and 2009 yielded a class win, which was sufficient testament to the car's capability that production of the LFA was confirmed three months later in August of 2009. The resulting production car bears a lot of evidence of its racing background. The technical features of the car reflect the obsessive performance-minded development that went into it. Carbon ceramic brakes, aluminum suspension components, remote reservoirs for the dampers to reduce heat sink, low friction suspension bushings, dry sump lubrication, as well as attentive focus on weight distribution and heat management. The packaging of the powertrain is particularly illustrative. The engine was developed from scratch, famously, to have the power of a V10, the external dimensions of a Lexus V8, and the weight of a V6. Dry sump lubrication allows it to be mounted low in the chassis, while the use of the transaxle at the back of the car allows the engine to be installed well back in the chassis. To further improve weight distribution, the radiators for engine cooling are mounted at the back of the car, while a central tunnel houses both torque tube and exhaust system and uses flow-through cooling, with cool air being drawn in through vents on the top of the hood and extracted via rectangular openings in the rear grills below the tail lamps. But in addition to imbuing the LFA with exceptional technical content, the car's designers put equal emphasis on the experience of interacting with it. Nowhere is this more evident than the engine. As with the legendary 2000 GT of the 1960s, Toyota turned to Yamaha to help with the LFA's power plant. Not just for their motorcycle-borne expertise making high-revving naturally aspirated engines, but because of their experience tuning sound for musical instruments. The airbox was specifically designed to resonate at the frequencies that please the human ear and provide the sensational induction noise that recalls the old Formula One race cars. That noise is piped in through an opening in the firewall to the cabin to bathe the occupants in unadulterated oral bliss. In fact, most of the car displays this attention to detail. The workmanship of the entire thing, both inside and out, is extraordinary, and each completed car was subjected to a full week of quality control, encompassing 7,000 checks, including track testing. If you have the context of the obsessive development of this car and the unwavering commitment to its mission as a driver's car, then the experience that the LFA provides will not surprise you too much. If, however, you know nothing about the LFA and you take a quick look at the car's configuration and then hop in for a ride, the experience will positively blow your mind off. Okay. 
It's a car that's extremely experience forward. It is so intense, so responsive, so focused, that it's difficult for your mind to properly process the car, especially if you expected it to be a comfortable, refined GT sort of experience because it's a Lexus that has the engine in the front. But this is a supercar, through and through, to the extent that it makes the Ferrari 458 Speciale feel a bit soft. Yes, really. Why? It comes down to the responses. Everything about how this car reacts to your inputs is knife edge. The throttle is famously so responsive that a digital tachometer was required to keep up with how quickly the engine gains revs. Six tenths of a second to go from idle to 9,000 RPM. The brake pedal is like this too, the slightest touch initially provides much more retardation than you expect, while the steering and chassis are much the same. The car turns in right now, as though it weighs nothing. To properly drive this car you must quiet down your inputs, it initially makes you feel very ham-fisted as a driver. Yet despite this, the car feels mechanical and tactile. These reactions don't feel artificial or overly assisted, they have a vitality and urgency that makes the car feel alive. Cars like the Ferrari 458 and 488, McLaren 720S, and Porsche 991 GT3 are so usable and civilized that any person with a driver's license could get the car from here to there with ease. Not the LFA. Ordinary control inputs are much too big for this car, and there's an old-school brutality to it. The suspension is stiff, much less compliant than a 458 or 991 GT3. It makes the LFA feel much more like a racing car and contributes to the impression of extreme focus. The powertrain echoes this. The single clutch gearbox is frankly, well, garbage. Seamless, smooth shifts seem impossible at any engine speed regardless of how much the driver tries to accommodate for the gearbox. Is it worse than a Ferrari F1? Doubtful, but that's also garbage. The car was developed during the final years of the awkward transitional phase between traditional manual gearboxes and the deeply impressive dual clutches of today, and so it has a single clutch. I will say that when going flat out, the gearbox is much better and that it's also very good at downshifts. It makes these wonderful mechanical noises from the shift actuators that you hear behind you when the box changes gears. It's exactly the sort of thing that modern cars try to insulate occupants from that you'd get in a vintage car. It's so un-Lexus. Still, I don't particularly like the gearbox. What I do like, however, no scratch that, love, is the engine. The LFA is so much more than an engine, but my god is the engine magnificent. Everything everyone ever says about it is true. The responsiveness, the noise, the build of power and torque throughout the rev range, the sheer unbridled pleasure of visiting the screaming red line is peak automotive enjoyment, a wildly theatrical and evocative experience that serves as an exclamation point to underscore the tragedy of the takeover of the turbos and the emergence of the electrics. One of the most common sensations while driving the LFA on the street is frustration, both from the car and the driver. The car feels impatient. It is so keen, so enthusiastic, so vibrant that the pesky limitations of real-world road conditions become an irritating constraint that prevent the car from achieving its one true desire, to be let off the leash. Today's supercars have this too, but for different reasons. Contemporary supercars give this feeling because they are so outrageously competent that they're dull at normal speeds, but the LFA is sort of the opposite. At normal speeds, instead of being boring, the LFA feels like it is bored. The chassis fidgets uncomfortably and the gearbox continually asks what's up with all these part throttle shifts so far away from the red line. The steering and gearbox seem overly responsive, as though delighted to get a request, any request, and reacting like an exuberant puppy. It's a car that craves big, fast, open roads or a racetrack. Even on a tight back road, it feels a little out of place. The chassis too stiff, the straights too short to properly wind out the motor. 
I'll admit that the car left me scratching my head for the first couple hours. I just couldn't find the environment where all the pieces came together. And then we found the road. The exact right road that was perfect for the LFA, and the car finally decided to allow me to view its shining brilliance in full HD. Just the right size turns, just the right pavement, just long enough straights to bang through a couple of gears. And then it all made sense. It's a brilliant, intoxicating, transcendent driver's car, one that involves, engages, overwhelms, and entertains the driver, and leaves them unable to speak or think after a spirited run. This car is 100% experience in a way that very few cars achieve. That's the secret to the resurgence in interest in the LFA. Well, for me, anyhow. Yes, it's rare, yes, it's technically impressive and beautifully made, and the obsessiveness with which it was developed is virtually unparalleled in the modern era. But all of those attributes are part of the car because they serve the goal of creating the sensational LFA experience. It's flawed in some senses. The gearbox is hopelessly outmoded, trying to adjust the fan speed of the HVAC system nearly brought me to tears, and it's so focused that it feels like it's not quite on the right road for a significant portion of the time that it's in motion. But the trade-off is that it's one of the most extraordinary driver's cars ever made, a rolling monument to driving that has been rendered with dazzling attention to detail that places the experience of those who interact with it as its most important purpose. Despite the passage of fewer than 10 years since the LFA stopped production, it already feels like it's from a different era, in the best possible way. The car is aging well because as a car gets older, absolute performance is no longer the key to its appeal. This is why the Duesenberg Model J, 300 SL Gullwings, and even the McLaren F1 are valuable today. Sure, there are faster cars now, but each of these cars, LFA included, used the world's finest engineering available in its day to deliver something timeless. One hell of a ride.